So when Or asked me to talk about uh, mobile security, I decided that I'm not going to talk about Android uh, as such because there's lots of information about Android security. So I'll, I'll uh, occasionally refer to Android. Uh, but I'm going to focus primarily on uh, aspects that you might not have had a chance to uh, find out about. So in the first part of this, uh, first two lectures, I'm going to talk about uh, hardware security and how hardware security is uh, uh, used by mobile platform security, operating systems and applications and so on. And in the second part, I'm going to touch about some of the usability challenges. So if you came here to learn about Android, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but there are plenty of uh, uh, sources and, and better experts who can tell you about Android. OK, so this let me go back to the. So like I said, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, mobile platform security, specifically um, about uh, the so-called trusted execution environment, which is a name used to refer to uh, hardware support for uh, platform security in general. Um, so uh, before we start, um, let me try to sort of uh, explain what I mean by trusted execution environment. So by execution environment, so we are all computer scientists, so by execution environment, I don't mean uh, a guillotine or anything like that. I mean uh, 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 the, the environment that you need to run software. So a processor, uh, memory, storage, peripherals, and so on. Uh, a trusted execution environment is an execution environment that, is, that has two properties. It should be integrity protected and isolated. And I think integrity protected is sort of self-evident. You, you should be able to trust the, the um, um, well, the integrity of the, the environment from the beginning throughout its uh, life. But when we say isolated, uh, it's, it's a relative term. So you have to say isolated with respect to what? Um, uh, and, and this is usually it refers to isolation with respect to the normal software that's running on a device. And sometimes this is called as the rich execution environment. So this is uh, if you have a phone and the phone is running Android and some applications, that constitutes the rich execution environment. And by trusted execution environment, we, we mean a different execution environment that is uh, A, integrity protected, and B, isolated from this Android and the applications. Um, if you have a phone or a tablet today, uh, chances are that uh, uh, you have this uh, trusted hardware-based trusted execution environment. Right? So I would bet that uh, pretty much uh, everyone who has a smartphone or tablet today already has this hardware trusted, trusted execution environment. And this is nothing new. It has been the case for the last, uh, I don't know, 12 years or so. But I would also bet that none of you are, uh, or few of you are aware of it, and uh, uh, next to nobody has an application that actually makes use of this. Right? So um, this is the kind of a curious state of affairs, that you have something that is uh, very powerful, uh, although um, so, so typically it takes a lot of effort to deploy something that's, uh, that has this kind of functionality. Uh, but it's not actually accessible to, to developers, and, and therefore users also don't have the, the opportunity to make use or benefit from this. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk is uh, first tell briefly about why we are in this situation. Why is it that uh, there is uh, hardware security uh, in, in mobile devices uh, in, in a, uh, deployed in a large scale? Uh, and then I'll, I'll talk uh, more about what we mean, mean by trusted execution environment. What are the characteristics of a trusted execution environment? Uh, and then we'll talk briefly about uh, uh, the efforts to make this trusted execution environment available to developers so that developers can protect their applications and services better by using this uh, hardware-based trusted execution environment. Uh, in the second part, um, hopefully in the second lecture, uh, I'm going to talk about recent standardization activities. So uh, uh, one difficulty of uh, developers having access to this, uh, this hardware security is that there has not been a, a standardized uh, interface. And, and this is starting to change now. There are uh, a couple of standardization bodies that are um, uh, trying to spell out standards that, that would be independent of a, a specific uh, type of trusted hardware. And, uh, and this might actually help change the situation. So I'm going to tell a little bit about uh, the standardization activities. Uh, and uh, in, in particular, I'll talk a bit more about uh, 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 a standard called um, uh, Trusted Platform Module, the second version of Trusted Platform Module. So those of you who are aware of Trusted Computing Group might know about TPM, or Trusted Platform Module. Uh, there's a new version of that that just came out, which has some interesting characteristics. I'll, I'll tell a little bit more about that. 
Uh, and then I'll conclude with um, um, some issues that I think are, are still open. OK, so let me start with this uh, look back. Um, so why, why do mo most mobile devices, uh, um, I would say pretty much every uh, smartphone and tablet out there, uh, has this uh, trusted execution environment? So to, to understand that, we have to sort of look at the history of uh, mobile devices. Um, so unlike PCs, mobile devices started out as closed systems, um, maybe about two decades ago. And, uh, and they did, uh, they're essentially embedded devices. They did a couple of things, uh, you know, making and receiving calls, sending and receiving messages, and they did them very well. Right? But over time, these closed systems became gradually opened, and open in the sense that you can install, you can extend the functionality of a device by installing software from different sources, and, and uh, not just the provider of the original device or the original operating system, but also other developers around the world. And, uh, and, and this transition happened in a, uh, in a more uh, controlled way because there were different um, um, sort of entities or stakeholders who are involved in this mobile operating system had different requirements. So compared to the PC world, the PC started out as an open system and, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, throughout their entire life, uh, they have remained as open systems. And whereas mobile devices had a different starting point, a different trajectory, and that actually explains why um, why we have this fairly advanced security measures, both in terms of hardware, but also in terms of software in mobile devices. So who are these uh, uh, different stakeholders and, and what their uh, motivations were and, and what requirements did they impose on, uh, on this process of opening up? Uh, we'll shed some light on, on, on this current scenario. So the first uh, uh, stakeholder, which is a very important part of any mobile ecosystem, are the mobile network operators. So these are the, uh, the Oranges and Vodafones and uh, AT&Ts of this world. They set up, build the infrastructure for mobile networks. Um, they are the ones with whom you as a, uh, as a user or subscriber will, will uh, enter into a contractual relationship. Uh, they might give you a SIM card and uh, you have a billing relationship with them. They know how to provide service and, uh, and charge money for you later. Uh, and, and, uh, and they are a, a crucial part of this mobile uh, uh, ecosystem. So they had certain uh, uh, requirements for the security properties that a mobile device should have. And this came out of their business models and business needs. So for example, um, a common business model uh, for mobile operators in, uh, in many parts of the world, I don't know if you have this in Israel, is uh, subsidized mobile devices. So a mobile operator will give you a, a phone, uh, either below cost or even for free. But in return, you agree that you will stick with that mobile operator for a year or two years, uh, and then you will not switch uh, mobile operators. Uh, so these are called uh, subsidy, mobile subsidies. And the mobile operators, of course, do this as a way to um, uh, expand their customer base. Uh, but they are incurring a cost upfront by giving a mobile device below cost or for free. So they need technical mechanisms to stop you from getting this uh, uh, mobile phone for free, and then uh, ditching the operator and, and going to a different operator, so taking away the, the original operator SIM card and putting in a new operator SIM card. So these are called subsidy locks or SIM locks. And from early on, mobile operators wanted mobile device manufacturers to uh, deploy mechanisms that will enforce the SIM lock so that you wouldn't be able to take out the uh, SIM that is bound to a mobile device and put a different SIM and still continue to use the device. And this meant that uh, uh, there was a need to have, for example, an uh, immutable identifier for every device so that you can say this subscription is, or a phone with this identifier is bound to this subscription, and uh, you can change it to maybe another uh, SIM card from the same operator, but you can't change it to a, a SIM card from a different operator. Um, they also got into the business of uh, selling content. So this started maybe about a decade ago. Uh, operators started with selling ringtones. You might remember that you could buy for uh, you know, 50 cents or a dollar, you could buy a custom ringtone. Uh, and of course, the mobile dev operators uh, would like you not to be able to forward that ringtone to other people. <coughs> um, so, so essentially, they needed a copy protection mechanism. And very quickly, they uh, graduated from ringtones to all type of other contents, like games and music and so on. So essentially, they wanted, uh, again, enforcement mechanisms to prevent copy protection, which leads to the standard requirements for, say, digital rights management. 
Um, and in, in particular, this would require that before they sell some content to you, they need to know what device they are selling it to, so they need to be authenticate the device and maybe bind the content to that particular device. Um, uh, it, it also, uh, so once you have uh, some uh, sensitive information on a device which is accessible to certain applications, so for example, you have a, uh, a media, uh, like a, a song that uh, should be accessible to a, a music player, they also have to separate between applications. So remember that these data DAOs are embedded systems, uh, which you couldn't extend with, uh, uh, by installing applications. So in the original operating systems, there was no need to separate between applications from, uh, from each other. Now that you have applications from different sources, some of them have privileged access, you need to be able to separate applications, partly from security, but also from reliability. If an application crashed, it shouldn't crash the whole system. So they also needed the mechanisms like application separation. So this is one, one class of uh, uh, requirements. The second uh, 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 kind of stakeholders are regulators. So if uh, mobile operators were motivated by business needs, regulators are motivated by the public good. So they are responsible for taking care of the interest of normal people. Um, so before you can sell a mobile device in a certain jurisdiction, um, uh, before like you know, Nokia or Samsung or Apple wants to sell a phone, in, uh, a phone model in, in Israel, they have to get approval from the local regulatory authority. Um, and uh, and this, this process is called type approval. So they have to submit the design and, and specification and all kinds of test results. And the, if the authority gives type approval, then you can start selling the device in that market. So in the United States, this authority is the Federal Communications Commission, or the FCC. And there's a similar body like this in, uh, in every jurisdiction. Um, and and they, they operate with the interest of the public in mind. So for example, one uh, uh, requirement for type approval is securely storing uh, radio frequency parameters. So when a mobile device is made, in the assembly line, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's initialized. So every device is slightly different from each other. So the, the, uh, the parameters that a mobile device would use for radio communication is initialized in the assembly line. So you start it up, and depending on the device, you can say this is the power with which, uh, this is the range of power with which this, this, device, this particular device can transmit, and so on. And uh, this is initialized at the assembly line, and it has to be stored somewhere so that every time the device boots, it will be able to uh, use these parameters as configured initially. Um, and the regulators require that this should be stored uh, securely, which means that, uh, it's, that the confidentiality of this is not such, a, such an issue, but the integrity that either a user or somebody else, maybe some application, shouldn't be able to change these uh, parameters. And, uh, and that there are different reasons for that. One of them is sort of uh, public health reasons, that if you transmit in higher uh, power, it might uh, cause harm to you. Um, the other one is also kind of a fairness issue. If you transmit, if you tweak your device to transmit at a higher power, you might get more of the, the bandwidth in a, in a certain neighborhood than all the others. Um, so they require that these parameters must be stored securely so that neither the user nor the uh, software on the device or unauthorized software on the device uh, would be able to change it. Uh, regulators are also interested in theft deterrence. Uh, stealing large numbers of mobile devices and selling them in another country is a big business. And uh, um, uh, one way to de uh, uh, deter that is to be able to, again, uniquely identify every device so that when a device shows up in a network, it can be checked against a, a database of uh, known stolen devices. Um, so again, re regulators require that there has to be immutable identification for mobile devices. And finally, there are end users. End users uh, grew up using these uh, uh, you know, closed embedded devices, which were very robust and, and secure. And when, when they opened up, they expect the same level of uh, uh, robustness and, and security. Unlike in, in, say, PCs, where all of you were trained to expect from day one that it might crash, it might blue screen, and, and that's, that's life. That's the way it is. Whereas it's harder to uh, uh, reduce the, le the level of uh, reliability to that level uh, for a user base that was used to very robust uh, mobile devices. Uh, and that meant that, again, that applications should be separated from each other so that one application, one faulty application couldn't bring down the whole device. Um, and, uh, and other considerations like theft protection and uh, uh, privacy and so on. So essentially, the, the point I'm, I, I want you to sort of uh, take from this is that uh, there were different expectations for security on mobile devices compared to PCs. 
And some of these expectations actually made their way into um, uh, standards documents or uh, compliance documents. So for example, this is an uh, uh, excerpt from the GSM standards. This is from 20 years ago, from the original version, and this is some years later. And you can't read this, of course, but what it says is that the IMEI, which is the unique identifier for every mobile device, uh, should be protected against tampering. And, and it says something like it should be protected against uh, uh, physical tampering or tampering by electronic means. Um, and uh, lower down here, it also says that this is a requirement for type approval. So if a, a device manufacturer cannot demonstrate to some level of uh, certainty that this is uh, done, uh, they won't be allowed to sell that device in, in certain jurisdictions. So what that meant was that um, these requirements, some of them are formal requirements, some of them are informal requirements, but all of them together meant that mobile device manufacturers were incentivized from very early on to design and deploy uh, platform security mechanisms, software and hardware security mechanisms. The, the most uh, uh, um, um, largely or widely deployed example of that is uh, J2ME. So J2ME, uh, uh, right nowadays it's called Java ME. Uh, it's uh, uh, essentially a, a, a stripped down version of Java that was meant for uh, mobile phones. And, and they, this came out like 15 years ago. And this is perhaps the most widely deployed uh, system in the world. I think more than uh, billions of devices had J2ME at some point. Uh, and J2ME had this, uh, this kind of a software architecture where you can separate between programs by saying, uh, um, for example, based on the origin, you know, which developer it came from, or who authorized a particular piece of software to be installed on your device. And depending on that, it can give different privileges to different pieces of software. Um, the, uh, for, uh, when, when smartphones started coming into the picture, uh, for example, the, most, the first smartphone operating system was Symbian, um, it came with the platform security architecture as well. Uh, and the other popular ones followed later. So Android uh, from day one had a platform security architecture and, and uh, Apple iOS had, uh, had one and so on. So essentially, platform security architect software architecture means that you as an ordinary user can install different applications, but unlike on a PC, they all won't run with uh, the same privileges, but you can have different privileges for different applications based on um, some criteria, such as uh, who, who is the developer. Uh, so those were software platforms like architectures. There were also hardware support, and, and this again started about uh, uh, 10 to 12 years ago. The first one was called M-Shield, which is a product from Texas Instruments, uh, it was jointly developed by Texas Instruments and Nokia. Uh, and a couple of years later, ARM, which is the company that designs the core that runs in pretty much all of your smartphones, uh, came up with an architecture called Trust Zone. So later on, we'll talk a little bit more uh, detail about Trust Zone. So all of this, you know, the, the smartphone revolution for most people happened with Android and iOS, but well before that, there was a, uh, not only the, the awareness, but also actual design and deployment of hardware and secu software platform security architectures. So much so that today, if anybody wants to develop a, a, a new hardware design or a new operating system for mobile devices, uh, they essentially have no option than to have platform security right from the beginning. So different starting points uh, uh, and then the different requirements was the reason why there is this uh, widespread uh, use of hardware and software platform security on, on mobile devices. Uh, so in this talk, or in this uh, two lectures, we are going to primarily talk about uh, hardware platform security. So I'm, uh, like I said, I'm not going to talk about Android or any other software platform security architectures. Um, if you are interested in that, uh, there are some pointers towards the end um, that, that might uh, tell, you to, uh, tell you about places where you can find more information. Um, so before I uh, start talking about uh, what's a trusted execution environment, what kind of characteristic it has, I also want to put this in uh, sort of historical context. So as computer scientists, we are often told that we forget about what happened in the past. Uh, and, and there's a risk that that might also happen uh, for mobile platform security. Like I said, uh, most people, even researchers who are working on smartphone uh, security and privacy, uh, the, the, the world starts for them in 2007 or 2008. Uh, but not only that there was mobile platform security before that, but the, the uh, concepts and the techniques that are used in mobile platform security actually borrows from uh, ideas that, that originated sometimes 30 years back. So the idea of uh, having a platform security architecture and using hardware security for uh, protecting them 
goes way back to the Cambridge cap machine. Uh, and uh, uh, even today, uh, platform security architectures uh, uh, borrow concepts from, from those days. So for example, uh, every uh, software platform security architecture, Android or Windows Phone or iOS, uh, have the idea of having different applications and, and giving rights to applications based on permissions or a permission-based architecture. And that goes way, way back to uh, the Wax VMS days where different users were uh, granted different privileges uh, telling them what they can do in the system. So there was ordinary computer security that goes way back to the, uh, the 1970s, but there are new developments that continue to happen like this TPM 2.0, which we'll talk about in the second lecture. Uh, Intel has a new trusted execution environment architecture called SGX, and these developments continue to happen. Um, there were also smart cards that are a form of hardware security, uh, which became popular in the late 80s and, and are widely deployed. And then uh, different types of mobile um, uh, security architectures that uh, uh, starting from about 2000 and going on um, uh, today. So in the first part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about these uh, uh, proprietary solutions like Trust Zone and uh, uh, M-Shield and uh, a system called Onboard Credentials that um, my group when I was at Nokia uh, worked on. And in the second part, I'm going to talk about the, the standards that are uh, involved in this space, like TPM 2.0 and, uh, and the so-called global platform trusted execution environment standards. Okay, so now let's uh, think about or talk about uh, uh, what, uh, you know, what is a trusted execution environment? What constitutes uh, a trusted execution environment? So if you remember, in the beginning we said, a trusted execution environment is, a, is an execution environment that is integrity protected but isolated from the, the uh, so-called rich execution environment. So rich execution environment is where you have an operating system like Android and you have applications like the Android apps. And a trusted execution environment is something that sits next to it. It might have its own operating system like entity and it can have its own applications which are typically called trusted applications. And, uh, and, and there is some support from hardware to provide this isolation between each other and to assure the integrity of this trusted execution environment. So um, uh, what I'm going to develop in the next uh, few slides is that a trusted execution environment essentially should have five characteristics. Uh, platform integrity, secure storage, isolated execution, device identification, device authentication. And these are motivated by the kinds of uh, requirements that we saw in the beginning, right? Um, uh, from the operators and from regulators and, and so on. Uh, and, and we'll sort of gra develop this one, uh, gradually and we'll end up with a, with a high level architecture like this. And then later I will tell you how this actually maps to, to uh, real systems out there. So, so don't, uh, um, don't pay attention to this yet because, because we'll build this picture uh, piece by piece. So before I do that, uh, let me introduce this, the, the notion of a trusted boot. Um, so uh, there are two kinds of trusted boot. Uh, one is called secure boot and the other is an authenticated boot. So if you think about the, the process of bootstrapping any device, you connect uh, uh, your phone or your PC or any other computing device uh, and give it power, uh, the, the actual starting up the system happens in a, um, in, in, in a sequence of stages. And this is called bootstrapping, right? So, so initially there is some firmware that gets powered up and the instruction pointer punch the firmware. The firmware uh, looks for a boot block, uh, which will tell where to find the operating system. So firmware gives control to the boot block, which might set something up, and then transfer control to the operating system kernel, and the operating system kernel will start operating system services and applications and so on. So secure boot, so this is the normal boot process that, that I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, with, with your computing devices. A secure boot uh, is one where uh, so first of all, the if you want a secure boot, you have to trust some, some, uh, the, the place where the boot process starts, in this case, the firmware. And uh, the, the, um, the firmware, and, and we'll see that in every stage of the, the boot process, there is a speci special checker module, which will check to see if the next stage in the, the uh, boot process is uh, acceptable, is, is good in some sense. Uh, and it's typically done by uh, taking a hash of the next, uh, the code that, that constitute the next portion. So for example, the firmware, if it's going to launch a boot block, it's going to take a cryptographic hash of the boot block and compare that with some known good value. And if, it's, uh, uh, if the comparison succeeds, then the boot process will pass. 
uh, otherwise it will fail and it will abort the boot. And, and this happens in every stage. So um, the checker will check if the next stage is okay. If it is okay, then transfer control to it. So of course the checker has to have some idea of what, what is okay, but we'll come to that in a, in a minute. Um, so why, why do we do this? Uh, so based on what I told this already, you can see that the, the idea would be to make sure that only known trusted software is allowed to be started on a device. Known trusted configuration of uh, firmware, boot block, OS kernel, and maybe even applications. And then the motivation for this is the kinds of requirements that we saw earlier. If you want to make sure that uh, you know, certain um, secure storage is implemented, then you have to trust what's running on the device at some level so that you can trust that to enforce secure storage. So that's secure boot. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, embedded devices, mobile devices, uh, uh, from the beginning always had secure boot. This is why you couldn't take your um, you know, Nokia phone five years ago or, or some other phone uh, um, a decade ago and change the operating system and run whatever you want because they all implemented secure boot. Uh, but secure boot can be restrictive in the sense that you are only allowed to run what you want. So the alternative is called authenticated boot. And the authenticated boot says you are allowed to start any configuration. Of course, it, uh, it doesn't allow you to do that without any, um, any other restriction because otherwise it will be the same as an insecure boot, right? What you do on your PC is you can start anything you want, but that's not authenticated boot. So authenticated boot comes from the caveat that, with the caveat that, uh, you can go through the boot process. There is no longer a checker that will stop um, uh, you from booting something other than the authorized uh, configuration. Uh, but there is, instead of a checker, there is a measure component starting from the firmware and, and every, in every layer that matters that will measure the, the, the next stage that you're going to boot and remember that as some kind of state information. And typically, the state information is represented in the form of an aggregated hash that we will come to see later. So as opposed to secure boot, where you will uh, stop the boot process if the user is trying to boot something that is uh, not allowed, authenticated boot will allow you to boot whatever you want, but remember what you have booted. So why is this useful? Um, um, you can do things like, uh, depending on what the state is, uh, of course, looking at the, the uh, trusted component in the device can look at the state and say whether you are running authorized uh, software or some other software. Uh, it can give different privileges. So for example, it would be possible to use, uh, say that uh, um, there is some secrets on the device that's accessible if you are running certain uh, uh, configuration of uh, operating system kernel and, and uh, libraries and so on. But if you're allowed to run anything, something else if you want to, but you won't have access to those secrets. So remember that uh, if, um, um, if you're a mobile device and that has a, a radio component that, that can transmit uh, and receive power, so we said that secure storage of the transmission parameters was important, but equally important is direct access to those components, right? If, we, if there is a, uh, 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 an application that can transmit, that can ignore these stored uh, values and that can transmit at a higher power, that would be bad. So if a device supports authenticated boot, if a device is a secure boot, then there's not an issue. If a device supports authenticated boot uh, and you are running a, a non-official configuration, it might be that it doesn't have a direct access to these radio uh, controllers. Um, so you can bind the, the configuration to resources. The resources could be either uh, things like this. Um, so you can uh, control access to resources like the, the, uh, uh, the radio transmitter, or you can control ac to access to secrets. So you can say, if this configuration stored a, a secret in an encrypted form, then only that configuration is allowed to get at those secrets. Some other configuration is allowed to run, but it won't have access to those secrets. Uh, it's also possible to report this configuration to some external verifier. And this is called remote attestation. So it might be the case that uh, uh, somebody wants to send you some information, but before they send to you, they want to make sure that you are running an authorized version. You have the option of running whatever version you want, but if you're running the authorized version, they can verify that remotely and, and send you this uh, information. Yes? So this state has to be, I assume, hardware protected? Yes. Otherwise, I, have to, I can just bypass it. By exactly. Right, so for the purposes of this talk, uh, we are talking about the, the, the need for hardware protection and then we'll also see how hardware protection helps these. 
So remote, you are right that without hardware protection, remote attestation uh, and even sealing is meaningless um, because uh, a, a user who can uh, attacker who can get to the lower level can can compromise these. Okay, so with this we'll we'll go through these uh, um, these uh, uh, five different attributes that I mentioned before. So the first one is platform integrity. And platform integrity means that you you need to be able to trust the the integrity of this trusted execution environment that you're going to, to start up. And, uh, and the two ways of uh, boots that we saw, secure boot and authenticated boot, will eventually essentially give you this, right? So with secure boot, we said only known configurations are uh, allowed to run. And if you trust this known configuration, um, then, then you can trust the integrity of the system. So uh, in, the, in the secure boot example, we saw that there's a checker module at every stage, and the checker module will compare the, the current measurement of what you're going to boot with some known reference values. So these known reference values have to come from somewhere. Uh, one way to do that is to use code signing. Right? So uh, the boot sequence will, uh, will look for some uh, boot code, <coughs> like a boot block. And the boot block is going to be an insecure storage because there is, uh, you try to minimize uh, the requirements inside this uh, uh, the trusted part, which is often called the trusted computing base. So this is the part that you sort of unconditionally trust. <clears throat> and uh, you're going to boot the, load the code from somewhere outside. Uh, but you need to know uh, uh, what value to compare against this. And this value to compare against uh, comes in the form of a code certificate, which is essentially the hash, uh, the known ref value, reference value of a known good uh, version, which is then signed by somebody who is uh, trusted. So this just puts the problem one level further, right? So the, the hash that you want to compare against uh, can come from outside, uh, but you, know, you need to verify the certificate that, uh, that brings this hash to you. So for this, you, you have to have some kind of verification route. And the verification route is typically in the form of a public key or a hash of a public key uh, whose private key will be used to sign this uh, uh, code certificate. So the boot process will go, uh, so, so to, to verify the public key, of course, you need some cryptographic primitives like a hash function and a signature verification algorithm. So all of this should be unconditionally trusted. They should be inside this trusted computing base. But once you have this, if you have the, for example, the device manufacturer's public key, you have the necessary cryptographic hash function, and you know where to find the, the next boot code, uh, then when the device starts up, it's going to give you a, a piece of boot code that it wants you to run. It's going to give you a certificate that the device manufacturer issued. And the trusted computing base can now verify the signature. If it is verifies correctly with respect to the verification route, it can use the hash value there to do the job of the checker that we saw in the uh, uh, secure boot case. So that's how secure boot would work to ensure platform integrity. If you don't have secure boot, then you, like we saw, we, you, you can boot whatever you want, but you have to remember what you booted. That means that you also need, in addition to these, you also need some kind of secure volatile memory within your trusted computing base so that whatever you measure can be stored in such a way that uh, anything from outside uh, the operating system or the application wouldn't be able to change this state information. So if you have uh, verification route, cryptographic mechanisms, and a volatile memory, then you can, uh, a small amount of volatile memory, then you can implement both secure boot and, and uh, uh, authenticated boot, depending on the case. So the next uh, uh, property that we had was secure storage. So secure storage is the ability to store some information that is relevant, such as, for example, radio parameters, um, in such a way that uh, their integrity is protected, and possibly, depending on the use case, maybe also their confidentiality needs to be protected. So again, the goal is to try to minimize what goes in here. So of course, the one option will be to have uh, a large amount of read-write storage here. But that's not a, a scalable option because it's going to uh, every additional um, uh, kilobyte of memory is going to add to the cost of the device. Um, so uh, the alternative way to do that is to say, within this uh, trusted computing base, you have one key, um, which is, uh, we can call it the device key, which is in protected memory because it's inside. And now you can use this key to turn any insecure storage into secure storage by uh, sealing data. So you can derive, uh, you can make a key hierarchy, and then uh, if you want to store a piece of information outside an insecure storage, you can uh, uh, encrypt and integrity protect this data with this key or something that's derived from this key, and then store outside. Okay? So that'll give you 
uh, uh, confidentiality and it will also give you integrity in the sense that if somebody changes uh, uh, the, the uh, seal storage, seal data that is in insecure storage, like the disk or the flash memory, uh, when you load it, it'll, uh, the, the cluster computing base will be able to detect this. Uh, but there is one, this is one more piece that's uh, uh, needed here for, um, uh, for the kinds of use cases that we saw before. Does, does anyone see what, what piece would be needed uh, in addition to this? So um, um, think about use cases like uh, uh, checks on the number of incorrect password guesses, right? So you are allowed to type in a password uh, wrong three times. And after that, the device might either sort of do some kind of back off, or, or it might even require that uh, it, the device is locked. And in order to unlock it, you have to have a, a different code which comes from somewhere else, like a, it's called a pin unlocking code. So those, uh, uh, that kind of applications require that uh, not only you should have state where you can store this information, like how many incorrect guesses you have, uh, you have made, um, so that the attacker won't be able to manipulate that, but you also need to protect against pot potential replay attacks. Because what an uh, attacker would do is uh, initially you have, he has three guesses. He can make a copy of this uh, insecure storage, try two guesses before the device locks, and then replace the old insecure, the old copy of the insecure storage so that he can again start with uh, uh, two more guesses. Um, other applications have similar needs. Assume that you buy uh, um, uh, a piece of music with, uh, at uh, say half price, which allows you to listen to 10 times. Uh, so after 10 times, uh, you have to pay the full price or something like that. So again, that requires integrity protected storage because uh, the count of the number of times you have used this has to be stored in secure storage, but should be resistant against any kind of replay attacks. So to protect against this, you need some amount of non-volatile memory um, that, that is read-write memory that, that can be updated. So this device key doesn't necessarily need to be updated. It can be a fixed key. Uh, that, that can provide confidentiality and integrity, but if you want rollback protection or replay protection, you need some memory that is updatable. It could be in the form of a counter, or it could be in the form of a checksum, but you, but you need some, some memory area that, uh, that is uh, uh, writable. So if you have that, you, you can do secure storage. The, the third uh, property was isolated execution. And uh, by isolated execution, we meant you are, you are able to run some code, which are called trusted applications, within this, uh, uh, this uh, trusted computing base, this, uh, this uh, perimeter that you trust, in such a way that the, the richest execution environment, the operating system applications, uh, won't be able to modify the operation of this trusted application and won't be able to uh, uh, find out what this application is doing. So again, because we want to keep this uh, storage minimal, uh, trusted applications would come from outside. So there will be some kind of entry point where the operating system can say, this is the trusted application that I want to run. Uh, and, and that might be mediated by some kind of an operating system inside. So we'll, we'll call this the TE management layer that can uh, load and, and uh, run applications. Um, but we, again, we need some kind of access control here, right? Because if there is no access control, then the trusted application that's running here has access to everything that's in here. It has access to this device key, it has access to the volatile memory, non-volatile memory, and so on. So we have to control uh, in order to guarantee the security of this kind of a system, if you want to run trusted applications, you have to uh, control what applications get run there. And again, this is using, uses uh, code signing. So there is already a verification route, and we can say only trusted applications that are signed by uh, some trusted authority, like the device manufacturer, can run here. This now probably gives you an idea why all of you have uh, trusted hardware, but no applications that, that actually make use of this or nothing that is visible to you. And the reason is because uh, this is a controlled environment and only trusted uh, or authorized applications can run there and authorized applications typically belong to the, the device manufacturer or maybe the carrier or maybe some other selected entities. Okay, so that's uh, isolated execution. The fourth one was device identification. The ability to identify or uh, uh, attach uh, um, um, untamperable or uh, immutable identifier to a device. So, of course, we can put some kind of identifier inside, uh, right? So, you can say there, is a, um, th there are some memory areas which are um, uh, written during manufacture. Um, and, and we want to, on the one hand, we want to minimize these. So, um, 
a device might have many identifiers. So you saw earlier that every device is required to have this IMEI, which is the International Mobile Equipment Identifier. Every mobile phone is required to have that. But in addition to that, if it has Wi-Fi, it has a Wi-Fi address. If it has Bluetooth, it has a Bluetooth address. And then it might have a bunch of other identifiers as well. So putting them all in, uh, inside this is not an option. There's another logistical problem here. So um, typically, this is going to be inside a chip. And chips are made by uh, fabrics, uh, I mean, um, chip uh, uh, fabs like um, uh, something in uh, maybe a uh, contractor in China or somebody who will make these. And then at the time of making these chips, they might not even know which mobile device uh, manufacturer is going to buy these chips. Right? They, a bunch of them might be sold to Samsung, another bunch might be sold to Microsoft. Uh, they might not even know that at the time of manufacturing. Uh, on the other hand, these names or these identifiers that we talked about, like IMEI and Bluetooth, uh, device identifier and Wi-Fi, they have structure. And the first part, uh, the first few bits of this actually identifies the device manufacturer. So if you have a Samsung phone, just by looking at the IMEI, you can tell that it's a Samsung phone. So if you want to actually put these identifiers here, then it would mean that you have to have uh, transfer large amounts of information from the uh, device manufacturer to the fab uh, so that the fab can actually put this information there. So in addition to this problem of timing that the fab at the time they make the chips, they don't even know, they might not even know who's going to use them. Uh, transferring large amounts of information in an integrity protected or maybe even a confidential way across big organizational boundaries is asking for trouble, right? So things can go wrong, information might get lost. Uh, uh, and and in, uh, to protect against that, you have to have enough safeguards, which means cost. So in practice, uh, uh, what happens is that there is some unique identifier here, which doesn't uh, actually belong to any of the standard structure identifiers that are required. But it could be a statistically unique identifier. It could be a random number that is generated within the chip uh, at the time of manufacture. And uh, all you are guaranteed that statistically, this is going to be unique. And then this base identity can then be paired or bound to any assigned identity at the time of manufacturing the device. So this base identity is initialized when the chip is manufactured. And uh, the base identity is bound to any number of assigned identities by just issuing them identity certificates. So when a bunch of devices come in an assembly line in, in, a, in a mobile phone factory, the, the, the Samsung factory uh, uh, labeling machine can say, uh, uh, for this particular device, it reads the, the base identity and issues a certificate saying that this base identity actually corresponds to this IMEI. And that's signed by uh, Samsung's uh, um, signing key for, for this purpose. So that way, you can actually assign, uh, 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 associate an arbitrary number of identifiers in such a way that it, it, they are immutable. They are uh, only the device manufacturer, only some trusted authorities allowed to change them, uh, but others won't be able to, uh, to make a device. So if you remember Stephen's talk in the, uh, on Monday, he talked about device cloning, which used to be a big problem. So this kind of a measure would avoid device cloning and was actually intended to avoid device cloning so that you can't just copy a device and copy its identifier and have it work because a, a device with the uh, incorrect identifier will refuse to boot if, it's, uh, uh, if it doesn't have a certificate which uh, binds its own identifier, its own random identifier to some assigned identifier that, that, uh, that the user wants to assign to that device. Okay, so once you have a, uh, once you have a, a identifier like this, then you can also use that to authenticate to other people, right? So if, you have a, if your device has a certain IMEI or a certain Wi-Fi MAC address, and if you want to prove this fact to some external party, then you can do that in the, in, 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 in the standard way in, in, uh, in security. So you have an identity, and you can associate a key with this identity. And the key can be either protected using the secure storage that we saw earlier, or it can be deterministically derived from this device key, because the device key is inside the device. And uh, you, you issue a device certificate that binds this, uh, uh, whatever identity you want to bind it to this particular key. And, uh, and after that, you can use any entity authentication protocol to prove to a third party that this is the identity that you have. Um, and, and these device certificates are again with, uh, issued by a device manufacturer or anybody authorized by the device manufacturer. And uh, whoever wants to verify the identity of the device has to, has to trust this uh, device manufacturer's trust route, the public key of the device manufacturer has the kind of basis to, to, 
uh, do this authentication process. Um, once you know how to identify a device and authenticate it remotely, you can also use this for this kind of um, attestation, right? So we said that in authenticated boot, the device can measure what it's booting, it can store that information securely within this trusted computing base. Now it can also, because it has this hardware support, it can also prove that to uh, uh, a third party. And this is called attestation, we'll, we'll come to that later. So now we have gone through these five properties, the platform integrity, uh, which can be achieved by either secure boot or authenticated boot. We have secure storage, isolated execution, device identification, device authentication, and then maybe also extending that to attestation. So every uh, um, um, trusted execution environment out there sort of maps to this uh, general architecture at some level. Um, so uh, as we saw earlier, there is this trusted execution environment on a device. There may be either one or multiple of these. Uh, there are trusted applications in this management layer. Then there's a rich execution environment that can communicate with the structured ex execution environment via, uh, for example, a device driver or some other communication channel. And there are a number of these structured execution environments that are out there. Um, so the most uh, widely deployed one is ARM Trust Zone, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but there are others as well. There's uh, Texas Instrument M-Shield that I told you about. Uh, there it can be things like the trusted platform module, which is like a separate uh, uh, discrete component. Um, there are also uh, architectures which support multiple of these. So the, the new Intel SGX architecture that I talked about supports multiple trusted execution environments simultaneously. So um, how would you actually realize this uh, uh, trusted execution environment in, in, uh, uh, if you're going to design one? And uh, this global platform standard identifies three, uh, um, broadly speaking, three different ways of doing this. So the first one is maybe the, the most intuitive one and the historically the most common one is to say you have a, a chip. So SOC is a system on a chip. And within the chip, you have a processor, memory, and so on. Uh, and uh, outside the chip connected by a bus, you might have memory and peripherals, but you also have an external coprocessor. So an external smart card or a TPM, these belong to this category. And you get isolation and integrity protection simply by definition, right? So because this is a separate unit, Anything running here can't interfere with this, and you can uh, use the standard uh, um, um, platform integrity to ensure that this is uh, uh, integrity protected. So that's the kind of traditional way to realize a trusted execution environment as a um, completely isolated uh, um, discrete component. Um, a variation on that is to say uh, there is an isolated component, except that it's not outside the system on a chip, it's actually inside. So it's, it's, it's part of the chip, uh, within the chip subsystem, but it's still a discrete component inside the chip. What this gets you is that uh, any kind of attacks on this interface, like the memory bus, is prevented if it's inside. But the more interesting one, which is the one that we are going to talk about uh, in a bit uh, more detail, is what we could call the processor secure environment. So ARM Trust Zone and M-Shield and then the kinds of trusted execution environments that you have on your device uh, falls into this category. So there is no discrete component. Um, but, but all of these things that are inside the uh, system on a chip uh, are instrumented in such a way that they can do this separation between the trusted execution environment and the uh, rich execution environment. So uh, after we move to the next uh, room, I can uh, go a bit uh, deeper into how one of these systems, Trust Zone, implements this. Okay, so we looked at these uh, uh, three different ways of uh, um, um, D designing or architecting this uh, trusted execution environment. And uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, now in a bit more detail is uh, uh, trust zone and, and how the um, trust zone architecture does this, uh, um, um, this trusted execution environment functionality. So trust zone is interesting because it's what is uh, uh, widely deployed. So ARM, the company that makes the trust zone core is, uh, if you don't know what ARM is, then, then it's perhaps the, the, the most influential uh, technology company that you have never heard of uh, because they changed the landscape of mobile devices and it's a European company that uh, owns, I don't know, 90, 90 plus percent uh, uh, market share. Uh, so pretty much every, not all, but pretty much every smartphone or tablet um, is based on an ARM core. And uh, after this original trusted execution environment design, which was by Traxxas Instruments and Nokia, ARM came up with this uh, um, uh, their own 
a variant of this. So uh, this picture is what you saw before. So there is a, this is the, you can think of this as the processor boundary or the chip boundary. Inside that there is a main CPU, there is a, a ROM and RAM inside, there may be other, uh, uh, other elements. Uh, but then this uh, chip talks to external memory and external peripherals via some bus and, and, and there are some controllers that uh, uh, help it do that. Uh, what ARM does is it allows the main processor to be in two different modes. And in their terminology, they call it secure world and normal world. And uh, which mode the processor happens to be in at any moment is reflected by a, a flag that the system maintains. And this flag is actually visible on this bus. So there's an internal bus uh, uh, using which the main processor communicates with uh, peripherals that are inside. Um, and, uh, and this uh, 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 flag that indicates which, which of the two worlds that the processor is in is visible to, via this bus. So what Trust Zone does is uh, for all these uh, 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 resources like memory and external devices that needs to be protected, it inserts access control hardware uh, between the bus and, and the, the resource. And, uh, and the access control hardware essentially looks at this flag to decide whether access can be granted or not. So for example, if this memory is accessible only in the secure world but not in the normal world, uh, because the information is visible on the bus, the access control card hardware can say um, uh, when the mem mem main CPU is in secure world mode, it's uh, allowed, but when it is in, uh, in the normal mode, it's not allowed. And uh, so in, in this kind of maps to this uh, general architecture, that picture that we saw earlier. So what is called the normal world is the rich, rich execution environment, which runs the operating system. What is called the secure world is the trusted execution environment, and you can have trusted applications, uh, this, this management layer, Trust Zone calls it a trusted operating system. And there are companies that sell trusted operating systems for uh, Trust Zone. And, uh, and this is mediated by the hardware support like this. So let me explain um, um, how Trust Zone operates and, and then sort of give you an example of what might happen during the boot. So, in, in, uh, so like we said, there is a normal world and trust, uh, uh, secure world. And, uh, and both of them have their own operating systems. And the operating systems are like any other operating system. There is a supervisor mode and there's a user mode. So your operating system, normal operating system runs here, your Android applications run, his, run here. And uh, on the other side, there's a similar division. There's a supervisor and then there can be trusted applications that run on top. Uh, whenever you boot the device, control first goes to this uh, secure world. And the secure world sets up, uh, the supervisor in the secure world sets up the the uh, configuration and parameters that it needs to set up. And, uh, and then it sets this flag, it's called the non-secure flag uh, or not secure flag to one, which means that it's true, uh, the, the processor is in this part. It sets the flag and then transfer control to the supervisor uh, the, in the uh, non-secure world. And uh, after that, the boot process uh, proceeds like it proceeds in any other system. And at some point, if, uh, sorry, uh, at some point, if an uh, uh, application, let's say your browser or your email application, uh, wants to use the secure site, so maybe there is a, a key that is protected by the secure site, and some application wants to use this key to sign an email. So in order to do that, because the, the trusted application is isolated from the rich application, it has to transfer control back to the trusted site, uh, the secure world, and, uh, and uh, run a trusted application that will do this uh, operation. Uh, and for that, there is a specific um, instruction called secure monitor call. So the uh, uh, application on this side will ask the operating system to issue the secure monitor call. And uh, secure monitor call immediately has the effect of setting this, uh, this bit to zero and shielding uh, the normal world uh, um, uh, from control. So that the control goes to a monitor, the monitor uh, 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 sets up what it needs to set up, and transfer control to this operating, the, the secure operating system on the secure world. Okay? And, uh, and like I said before, this flag is now visible over this bus uh, so that uh, uh, the access control hardware can do access control to discrete elements. It can say this particular memory bank is only accessible when this, uh, this flag is set to zero, which means you're in the secure world uh, and not otherwise. So it can have a, a, a security policies like that. Furthermore, um, the memory management unit can also be trust zone aware. So that the memory management unit also can see this flag 
and, and can do access control not at the level of discrete elements but arbitrary memory location. So for example, the, uh, if you have a physical address range like this, the, uh, you can set a policy that says no, this part of the on-chip ROM is not accessible to the normal world, but secure world has the read rate access, but some the remaining part of the on-chip ROM and some part of the on-chip RAM is, uh, uh, for the normal world, there's only write access, uh, but uh, um, write-only access, and for secure world, it's read-only access for whatever reason. So you can set access control policies not only at the discrete element level, but also at the memory address level, at arbitrary ranges of memory addresses. So let me give you an example of how this might work in, uh, in a hypothetical boot scenario. So let's assume that there's a device that has an on-chip RAM and some on-chip uh, ROM and RAM and some main memory which is outside the, uh, the, the processor. And let's say that there is a key in the on-chip RAM which is maybe the device key. So this is a, a, a secret that is uh, 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 embedded inside the trusted computing base of the device. So when uh, Trust Zone boots up, like I said, the control goes to the Secure World Supervisor, and Secure World Supervisor will set initial policies. And it can set something very uh, safe and basic, like uh, no access to anything to the normal world because normal world is not yet running. For the Secure World, everything is readable and writable. So this is just to set the initial uh, access control. And then it can do things like, uh, so for example, the actual bootstrapping code, the boot block might be, or the, the firmware will be in the ROM inside the uh, um, um, transfer computing base. So that has to be copied to this RAM so that it can be executed. And it might be also the case that we have this key, but then for actual use, we are not using the key directly. We are going to diversify that key by uh, some kind of diversification mechanism, perhaps depending on the time or something like that. Uh, so it, uh, the, the uh, uh, supervisor can do all this. It can copy the code. It can also copy the keys and maybe derive the uh, uh, new keys and put them in the RAM. And, uh, and at this point, it can decide that there is no need for anybody to have access to this on-chip ROM because we have taken what we need from there. So as long as the device is uh, active, uh, not rebooted, uh, this can be shielded off. So it can set uh, uh, kind of the address controller uh, to shield off this so that nobody else has access to this. So these ones remain as before. And now it can start to prepare for normal world boot. So when the, when the normal world, when the operating system is running, of course the operating system needs access to main memory so that it, it needs read and write access to main memory or as parts of the main memory. And, uh, but it shouldn't have access to these on-chip uh, ROM and RAM typically. Right? So it can set things up like this and say in the main memory, normal world has read and write access, but also the secure world has read and write access. Uh, whereas this one remains as before. And now it can load the, uh, the bootloader for the operating system into the main memory and, uh, uh, and transfer control. So that secure world supervisor will now go to the normal world supervisor after having set this uh, uh, not secure flag to one. And uh, the normal world just does its thing. It uh, starts the, um, loads the operating system, sets up the memory management unit, uh, starts drivers and so on. At some later point, uh, uh, an application on the uh, non-secure side wants to make use of a trusted application. So it will ask the supervisor via a library function, and the supervisor will issue this. Uh, so so before, the, uh, before it does that, it has to actually figure out or specify what is it that it wants to do on the, on the secure world. So it wants to run some trusted application a name trusted application, maybe some signing application that signs a key. It has to give information like input parameters, set up memory to receive uh, uh, the return information, so it might give a message and set up uh, reserve enough memory to receive the signature on that message. So all of that is set up in the main memory and, uh, and then it uh, issues this uh, uh, SMC call, which will transfer control to the secure world monitor. And the secure world monitor will copy this information that's transferred from the main memory to on-chip RAM. This, this is, would be one way of doing that. So it can say, uh, it identifies which application uh, needs to be run. So it could, be, it could take the trusted application code and the signature or certificate for that code. It can transfer that to the RAM. It can also transfer input parameters to the RAM and, uh, and then it can give control to the, um, to the other side. You had a question? Yeah, if you have a multi-core device, do you have one core working in the secure world and one core working in the normal world at the same time somehow? 
So th this is an open question, how to actually do this for multi-coin. We'll come to that later. Uh, so I think different people have different uh, uh, um, suggestions. Reserving one core only for uh, trusted execution environment or having this kind of allowing each core to say, act differently but coordinate between them somehow. Uh, but now I'm talking about single core devices only. And um, as far as I know, there is no definite uh, uh, um, design uh, proposal for how to deal with multi-cores. Okay, so uh, on the, uh, um, the normal world, uh, um, the secure world, uh, um, uh, supervisor will then uh, schedule the, the application. It will do the kinds of checks that we talked about before, if it's uh, signed by uh, the correct authority and so on. And then it'll run the application, maybe make the signature, uh, transfer the information back, and then give control back to the um, operating system. So this is how the the, an example operation might go. Question? The Trapton is independent of the OS, or should, it, should the OS need to somehow uh, have, an, have an API, API for this thing? So, uh, yes, so OS has this, this instruction, secure monitor call, for example. It can invoke this instruction to tell the processor to go into trust zone mode. It also has, um, um, well, so these instructions are then made visible to the operating system and applications as API calls. And we'll talk about some of these APIs later. So there could be high level APIs like load this trusted application. And under the hood, that load the trusted application will issue instructions like this uh, um, SMC. So there are, there are process instructions and then there are APIs, high level APIs. Um, depending on the policy that's set up. So um, typically, so for example, you might load some trusted application that's not properly signed. In which case, uh, uh, so remember that this is set up by the insecure side. The insecure side is going to say, I want to run this trusted application, here are the parameters. Uh, whether it is run or not depends on the checks that are made by the trusted execution environment and it might say, you have, uh, your trusted application is not signed properly and therefore the, the invocation fails. Okay. So um, um, we'll, we'll come to this interface question now. That's so the secure world uh, looks like this, and uh, and there is some kind of uh, uh, instructions or some kind of uh, uh, way for the operating systems to interact with this. So secure monitor call is something like that. It's an instruction, uh, but we also need ways for applications to be able to make use of that. We also need high-level APIs. Um, so. Even though Trust Zone is available on the majority of the devices, what has been missing is really this high-level API. How can developers uh, make use of this? Um, so in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll quickly talk about uh, uh, what kind of APIs are out there and, and how this is uh, changing. So um, for smart cards, there are standard APIs like uh, JSR 177 for Java and PKCS 11. Um, in popular operating system like iOS and Android, it's possible to store keys, uh, like RSA keys, for example, create keys and store them so that they are protected by the trusted execution environment, but that's all you can do. So remember that initially we said trusted execution environment is like a Turing machine. It can run arbitrary applications. So these mobile hardware key stores don't allow you yet to run arbitrary applications, but it can give you access to certain functionality like cryptographic operations. Um, so to, to actually make use of the power of this programmability, there is really no uh, widespread standard API yet, or not that's publicly deployed. Um, there are two things that, uh, um, um, that are out there. One is this project that I mentioned that my group started about six or seven years ago when I was still at Nokia, and that's called onboard credentials. And the idea of onboard credentials is provide an API for an ordinary developer to uh, not only use standard functionality, but write their own functionality and say that should be executed inside the trusted execution environment. There is a company called Trustonic, and one of the authors of this presentation is, is a, my former student who now works for Trustonic. They, uh, the, the, they provide this um, operating systems for trusted execution environments, and they also have their own API, which is, I think, deployed in, uh, uh, for example, uh, all the Samsung Galaxy devices. Um, so I'm going to tell briefly about what is possible in the Android Key Store and then something about this uh, onboard credentials. So in the Android Key Store, you use the standard Java crypto uh, extensions. 
And uh, for example, you can do things like you can say, I want to generate a key pair, and you can call this method uh, key pair generate get instance, and you can say what algorithm you want to use. And uh, it's possible to specify um, uh, the, uh, the local key store, the native key store called Android key store. And if you specify that, then the key pair that is created will be actually protected not just by the operating system, but by the, the uh, trusted execution environment and its secure storage. So this is from a year ago when this functionality was not advertised by Google, but um, um, this is a, a hacker, an enthusiast. He sort of figured out that this functionality was already available. I believe that now this Google even advertises either this or something similar to this uh, um, publicly so that you can create uh, and operate on RSA key pairs in such a way that they are protected by the, uh, by the TE and not by the operating systems. So in other words, this means that if your operating system is compromised, uh, it won't be, if there's malware in the operating system, it won't be able to steal your RSA keys and send it somewhere. It can still use the RSA keys. It can sign something, but it won't be able to steal them and send them somewhere else. Do you have a question? Does the store symmetric here or only I think this is only asymmetric key as far as I know, but I, I don't know the current situation. Um, so a year ago, they, you were able to use RSA keys using this. And uh, under the hood, it worked like this. So they have Java, you have Java cryptography extension, which is standard. Uh, but if you use this particular uh, keyword, then Android operating system uh, handed control over to the, to the um, um, chip-specific library. So the, these were at that time for Qualcomm chips, and Qualcomm had a chip-specific library which knows how to talk to the Qualcomm secure environment. So the operating system on the uh, ARM chip here was called uh, QSEE, which is Qualcomm's uh, version of the trusted operating system. And uh, uh, it allowed you things like um, you know, generate a key pair, importing a key pair, um, signing and verifying data. And uh, so all the storage, the actual keys are of course stored in the normal world, in the normal uh, 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 whatever storage, a disk or flash that's available, but it is protected by this uh, secure environment, uh, trusted execution environment using the secure storage mechanisms that we saw earlier, so that uh, you, you encrypt and integrity protect and give back the, the, the key blob that can be stored outside. So whenever you want to sign, uh, the, this, uh, uh, this library here knows how to pick the encrypted key and hand it over to the trusted execution environment to unwrap and, and use it for signature. OK, so um, um, like I said, uh, this, uh, even though you are allowed to use, and I think uh, iOS also um, automatically provides this functionality. So if you create a key pair in iOS, I think wherever possible, it's protected by the trusted execution environment. Um, but they don't make use of the full programmability. Uh, so I'll tell briefly about what we did in this onboard credentials project. And in the next lecture, in the, uh, after the break, uh, I'll, I'll tell you about the uh, standardization activities that are trying to actually um, do similar things, uh, but in a standardized way. Um, so this is a project that we call Onboard Credentials, and then it, it basically grew out of this frustration. So I was working for Nokia, and like I said, this has been the situation for 10 years. For 10 years, we had this trusted execution environment, but even we as researchers could not use this for um, I don't know, in implementing our cryptographic protocol, because only, uh, uh, I mean, even within the company, only an authorized small group was allowed to write trusted applications. And this is necessary because every trusted application is like every other trusted application, was equally powerful. And uh, uh, anybody who writes a trusted application essentially has full control over the device. They can subvert uh, subsidy locks, they can subvert DRM, they can subvert all other trusted applications. Uh, so on the one hand, you had this very powerful functionality that uh, the cost of deploying which has already been paid, on the other hand, it was not available to developers. So what we wanted to do was, you, know, you can imagine that uh, having all kinds of physical tokens that you carry today, like credit cards and secure ID cards and smart cards and physical keys and so on, all of them can be virtualized and put on a mobile device, which will make your life uh, more convenient. Uh, but for many of these cases, you cannot just rely on software security. On the other hand, because this uh, hardware security is already deployed, if it was possible to use this in a in a uh, way that you can write applications that, em uh, that embody this kind of tokens, would be able to use hardware security, um, that would be a good thing. But it should be done in such a way that uh, every time somebody thinks of a, thinks of a new kind of credential, 
they don't have to queue to the device manufacturer or even a small group within the device manufacturer to be able to use that. They should have an open platform that, uh, uh, where they can sort of write uh, uh, trusted applications and deploy them. Of course, you want to do this without, um, while making sure that uh, a trusted application wouldn't be able to interfere with the operations of other trusted applications and also would, wouldn't be able to damage the underlying system as a whole. Um, so, um, the, the, the two co-authors, they were my former PhD students and their dissertations were actually based on how to design this and what kind of applications it can be used for and so on. So essentially what we have is very similar to the picture that we saw before. Inside the trusted execution manual, you have an interpreter. So it's not just an operating system, but an interpreter that can isolate uh, uh, trusted applications from each other. And uh, on the mobile operating side, we had an API that applications could use. Uh, the, the kind of distinguishing feature of what we did was this idea of open, what we call open provisioning. So the um, um, smart cards typically have a very centralized provisioning model. So if some service provider wants to use smart card, they have to all go through a central authority. And it's the central authority that can provision smart card applications to your smart card. And this is a very standard model. And what this means is that in, even though technically there are multi-application smart cards, in practice, they are single application smart card because if you as a developer want to deploy uh, an application to my smart card, you have to go talk to the, the entity that controls my smart card, which may be my employer or my bank or my operator or whatever. So we want to turn this model into a uh, more like an app store model where uh, we design a security architecture here so that any service provider, as long as you and the service provider agree, they can deploy a trusted application that allows you to uh, uh, securely use their application. So a bank can uh, send you a trusted application which, can, which you can use to authenticate back to the bank. Your employer can send you an RSA secure ID token which you can use to authenticate back to the, uh, your corporate VPN and so on. And, uh, um, and in fact, uh, one of the first applications we did was in collaboration with RSA because like uh, Stephen said, say RSA secure ID had uh, these so-called soft tokens, which are implemented in Java. So instead of having this physical token, you can have a Java application that you install on your device. And, uh, and they were not very happy about this because you can, of course, reverse engineer a Java application and get the, uh, the, the key, the shared key between the token and the backend. So they were very keen to be able to use something like this. And, and, and they actually used this onboard credentials to prototype the uh, a soft token, which they never uh, brought to market, but they were one of the first users. Uh, <clears throat> so the actual uh, provisioning model is uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, every device uh, having OBC has a certified key pair that auth authorizes that device as having a genuine uh, uh, OBC implementation. And uh, somebody who wants to provision to this device essentially gets the public key of this uh, and the certificate, and uh, they can now create a security domain on your device by provisioning what we call a family key. So they can send a key and they know that that key will only come to the OBC, the onboard credential or the trusted execution environment on your device. And then they can say, this key is going to define a new family that I will control. And, uh, and uh, they can then use this family to provision secrets. So they can say, here's a shared secret that this user is going to use to authenticate back to me. And they can protect that using this family key so that the, the, the system on the user device knows that that key belongs to that particular family. They can also authorize applications. So essentially, they can do code signing. They can say, here is an application that should be allowed access to keys in this family. Uh, so they can take the hash of the application and, and say, uh, I authorize this application with my family key. The reason why we use symmetric keys was, at that time, six or seven years ago, RSA was still um, um, rather the, the amount of memory we had was rather limited. So we were talking about code that should fit into few kilobytes of uh, uh, memory. And, and therefore we had to cut corners and then uh, um, without compromising security, but using a symmetric key, of course, um, um, isn't as flexible as using a, um, a, 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 a private key for uh, a symmetric key pair for code signing. Um, but, it, but the, the functionality is essentially the same. Um, so essentially what we were doing was, you could call this the principle of same origin policy. So we allow any service provider, as long as the user agrees to install their software, we allow them to create a domain. 
But once they create a domain, it's, we make sure that no other domain can interfere with this domain because the domain is defined by this family key. Uh, so we can sort of track uh, which applications are authorized to this domain and so on. And there is no limit on the number of domains. And this is what we call open provisioning, so that a service provider who wants to use this don't have to go through some central authority. They can uh, um, provision an application, a trusted application to you as long as you agree. Um, the, the programmability is very simple. We use a kind of basic like language. Uh, language. Uh, again, uh, the reason why we didn't use Java was because we were talking about very tight memory restrictions. So we couldn't actually fit a Java interpreter there. We had to write our own custom interpreter. I'm not going to go through that, but I'll, I'll tell you a couple of examples where this was actually used. Uh, so one is called um, MirrorLink. MirrorLink is a, is a consortium uh, uh, called Car Connectivity Consortium, and, and this specifies standards for how to use your mobile device with the car, um, um, car peripherals, so that you can run your mapping uh, navigation applications on your mobile device, but you can use your car steering wheel controls or the car display to actually interact with the the navigation application. And uh, one of the problems uh, with this scenario is that there are driver distraction regulations in every country that says that if the car is moving, uh, then you shouldn't use the car display to, for example, show a movie, because that will distract the driver. Um, so they want to be able to, uh, they needed a mechanism to know what, but on the other hand, uh, navigation application is okay while you're driving, because that's the whole point of navigation. So the car head, head unit has to be able to tell whether what is being shown on its display is a navigation application or a movie. And, uh, and this particular architecture was done in a uh, way that it was using these car peripherals as a passive uh, thing. So the car peripheral doesn't, wasn't actually running anything. The application was running on the mobile device and you were just using the car peripherals as display or input device. So how can the car peripheral tell what class of applications uh, uh, is being, being run currently? Uh, and then the way to do that, as we saw, was attestation. So attestation is a way to say, if you can do something, if you can measure something securely on a device, attestation allows you to report that to some external entity securely. So if you have a device that has platform security and trusted execution environment, and the device can, of course, tell whether you are running a, a map a navigation application or whether you're running a movie, it can now use attestation to communicate this information to the car. So this is what we did in a, in a paper that was published a few years ago. And, and this was actually uh, implemented in, uh, uh, in, in car connectivity, in, in MirrorLink. I don't really know about the deployment status now. Um, I, I won't uh, talk more about the details, uh, but essentially it's an attestation protocol. The second thing was um, a ticketing application. Um, so this was actually trialed in, in New York in the, the um, Long Island uh, Transport Extension. Um, so what they wanted was, uh, again, use your mobile device as a ticketing tool. And uh, uh, the, the underlying functionality that they needed was a trusted counter, so that every time you go through a checkpoint like this, um, uh, there is no, so this one, this checkpoint is not connected to any backend or anything like that. But if you touch it, you should remember uh, that the fact that you have touched this. And, uh, uh, and every time you touch, the count should be increased. And of course, the user shouldn't be able to manipulate this counter, um, so they need a trusted counter functionality. And if you have a trusted execution environment, then it's easy to implement a trusted counter functionality. So that's what uh, we did, or, or this, my student and uh, uh, another student did, and then this was uh, published in another paper. And uh, they actually did a trial with uh, about 100 uh, different tra travelers. And uh, this was done by Nokia, and. Uh, like Or was saying that Nokia at that time was a big company, then it became a small company again, so this actually wasn't really uh, taken into a product. Uh, the, the details don't uh, matter so much. So let me summarize this by saying that so I tried to explain to you why trusted execution environments are deployed in a large scale. They, they came because of requirements like DRM and subsidy lock. Um, and even though they are widely deployed, uh, ordinary developers haven't been able to use this, uh, or they have been able to use this in a very limited way now. So for a long time, there was no way you could use this. In the last couple of years, you can use this for some limited operations. Um, the, the promise in this is in this programmability platforms. What we did was a 
sort of it was an uh, it was initially a research project. It is deployed in the Nokia Lumia devices, but it's a proprietary solution that's only on those devices. Um, and this, I, I hope we demonstrated that it can be TE, uh, TEs can be opened up to developers in such a way that it doesn't harm the security for the original reasons for which it was uh, somebody paid the cost of deploying them. And uh, um, what we will talk about in the next half is uh, how is this functionality being standardized and uh, uh, how that might hopefully change this problem of uh, developers not having the access to this. So if you have any questions, I can take questions now. Otherwise, I guess we'll go for the coffee break. Yes. Uh, a few slides back <laughs> um, show the, uh, the open service provider model where, where the first time the first time a service provider is new to me. Yes. Three, Oops, sorry. Near the end. This one. Uh, yes. Um, this looks similar. This looks similar to um, on the web. The first time I authorize, um, the first time I recognize, say, my bank yes. as authorized, as, as certified. And yes. The way I do that is I look at the browser. Yes. And if I'm really awake, I look at the lock and I look at his certificate and see who the certificate authority is is convincing me that that's really my bank who is really going to authorize these applications. Uh, does that work the same way in mobile, and is that realistic? You know, I'm, I was then imagining, with your next slide, sitting in my car, uh, parked, with my little device, and I'm looking at certificate authorities to decide whether this is the real, the real provider or authorized right. or somebody else. So, so I think there are actually tools that automate this so that uh, your browser will remember the first time it went to a website. And, and if you go to the, um, uh, another website, uh, the same website again, and it's certified by a different key, the browser can warn you because it knows that you have seen this website with, uh, with one certificate before. And if the certificate changed, right. maybe worried, you're being done. Right. So, uh, so this is essentially this, this is what I call the same origin policy. The first time you, you have no basis to trust. Uh, so you kind of uh, make a separate enclave, a separate enclosure for that. This is what we call the family. So you can say anybody can create a new family. We don't know who they are, but we, they can create a family and they can authorize application to that family. But once you have done that, so if you create a family on his device, I wouldn't be able to steal your secrets from uh, uh, his device. That's what the system guarantees. And, and this kind of... Um, uh, so essentially what we are doing is linkability. We can say you create a domain and we make sure that you will, will track uh, activities in your domains and I can create a domain and these are two things that are isolated. What happens in this, uh, uh, this case is that the, the car, of course, knows a certain public key. It, it will trust uh, uh, the manufacturer. So they have their own certificate infrastructure. So the onboard credential mechanism that I showed before, it doesn't require a certificate infrastructure. It just says if you... You only need to know this original public key that comes from the manufacturer. After that, the manufacturer doesn't have to authorize any uh, developers. Uh, uh, there is no authentication of the provider. All we do is once the provider, uh, once you let a provider uh, uh, establish a foothold on your device, we can make sure that nobody else can mess with that provider and the provider can't mess with anybody else. Here we can go, so that, that, that's not exclusive, uh, it's not mutually exclusive from having a proper PKI. Uh, in this case, they have a PKI. All the, uh, this consortium runs a PKI, so all the cars knows all the authorized uh, device manufacturers, and the attestation that comes from a device manufacturer uh, is accepted only if they belong to the consortium. So the user is unaware of any of these. Remember that the user is the enemy here, right? The user is the one who wants to watch a video and drive a car, um, and, uh, and, and the car manufacturer wants to stop this case. Does, does that answer your question? Sounds like in, it sounds like the, the PKI keys Needed here. Valid is, built, is built into the devices like right. the cars. Right. The, car the car manufacturer has to get it right. Right. So, so the, the underlying functionality doesn't require a PKI, but in particular use cases like this one can actually bolt on a PKI on top. And then a PKI is essential for something like this because a car cannot just trust any arbitrary device manufacturer. Yes. About the application that you can link uh, your mobile device to the car, what happens if someone uh, steals a certificate of the, of the manufacturer? 
back here. Uh, you can install uh, apps. Install apps on the, on the car or something like that. Um, no, so, uh, right. So, well, first of all, if, uh, if a mobile device manufacturer's keys are stolen, then, then that's a big problem, right? So um, they have to take care of that. So what happens is that in, in this particular example, if, uh, say, Samsung keys are stolen, then you as a user could uh, install them on your Linux laptop and run a video on your Linux laptop and then convince the car that it's actually a Maps application. And the car wouldn't know. The car would uh, let you see it. Um, so that's the kind of uh, damage that can happen. No, like no, no. So, so this one is built on top. Of, so the, the original OBC doesn't have any, because it doesn't use certificates other than the manufacturer certificate. This one has a, a, a proper PKI that has all the joys and travails of a PKI. So they, they can revoke manufacturer's certificates and so on. But this is on top of OBC as an application. Yes. Oh, no. So, so, so remember that the original motivation was not for protecting the user. It was for things like DRM and yeah, so, so. Yes. So, uh, what you are talking about is what's called a trusted UI. We'll, we'll talk about that again as a kind of open problem. So, right now, um, nobody I know has this, and the reason is cost. Because uh, so. When I was in Nokia, we had this long fight that we wanted to let us have a, either a button or an LED or something that we can control. Uh, but normally, this will add some cost, like say five cents for a LED, and that will translate to about 10 euros in the price of a device. And uh, the decision makers will look at to see uh, what is this 10 euros going to bring us if they give it to us or if they give it to like the, the people who write games. And guess who wins in the end? The people who write games win. So. Uh, even allocating you know, a little part of the real estate for trusted UI indications and so on um, hasn't been successful, primarily driven by cost. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about this later uh, uh, in the sort of open issue section, but also in the usability part in the afternoon. Um, the, technically, people know how to do this, or at some level, it hasn't been validated in large scale user study. Uh, but in practice, what is stopping uh, from mobile devices from having a proper user interface is Every bit of user interface that's available on mobile devices uh, is uh, incentivized to provide a better experience for the user. Um, you know, a game that uses all your uh, uh, screen real estate and LEDs and so on eventually wins out over any kind of security use. Yes? So is cost the reason why they use the single flag to distinguish between secure world and normal world? No, I think that was a design choice, and it actually has benefits, right? So, the, unlike in a smart card, which is an external uh, element, uh, here it's the same processor that is uh, uh, implementing both the real execution, uh, the rich execution environment, the trusted execution environment. What that means is that any improvement in processor speed, you just immediately inherit that in the trusted execution environment. Whereas in smart card, like TPMs were notoriously slow. You have a fast processor, and if you want to offload cryptography to a TPM, uh, it might be an 8-bit processor with a very low clock rate and so on. So doing the, the design in this way that the trusted execution environment was not a discrete component, but what this logical processor mode has some advantages. I don't think cost was the reason for them to do this. I think uh, uh, they thought that this is an alternative design that has its own uh, benefits. But I, I, I'm not the designer, so I don't. I don't know the real answer, but this is my guess. If there are no other questions, let's take a break uh, until 11.30, I guess.